Talk big. Create, save and protect with RSM. Welcome to the RSM Talk Big podcast, helping you invest well, understand money and achieve the best tax outcomes. Your hosts today are Andrew Sykes, Chris Oates and Young Han. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for the RSM Talk Big podcast. I'm your host today, and I'm joined here with your regular hosts, Young and Chris. G'day, guys. Hi, everyone. Hey, Andrew. So it's tax time. Let's talk some tax. It's a big tax year. There's a few changes, and we're going to run through a few tips, a few golden rules, a few new tax changes, and just some general hints, advice, and what you can do to improve your tax return. So let's kick off with our golden rules of deductibility. What's changed? So the golden rules, so Young, is that where, I suppose it's about what can be, can be claimed, can't be claimed, or what the rules are around that? Yeah, what makes something deductible? Well, you need to make sure that there is a connection to your income generated. So if you can't show the the connection between the expenses that's actually been used for your work purpose, you obviously cannot claim. So first golden rule is it has to be connected to your work. That's correct. Okay. What else do we need? If you're working and you pay for it and your employer, let's say, they'll give you some money back, can... They'll probably claim a deduction. Can you do it as well? Because it's come out of your bank account and you've paid for it. But that's a question we get asked all the time. So if you get a reimbursement for an expense, it's not deductible for you. That's correct. And you're not going to be taxed on it because the employer give it back to you, but you're also not getting the deduction either. So it's just pure, you know, you spent it, you got it back, just leave it at that and don't confuse yourself. So second golden rule, you actually have to have incurred the expense. So would that be... If I'm driving my car and I'm driving somewhere for work, so you can either in your own tax return claim your kilometres or your employer might pay you a certain amount of cents per kilometre travelled. So is that the example that we're we're sort of talking about? So you can only claim in your tax return if your employer didn't pay you for that expenses. So if you are using the kilometre method and then you say, oh, I uh, travelled to Sydney for a conference and then you're claiming that in your tax return and your employer didn't give you the money, then you can claim in your tax return. But if your employer actually gave you some money for it, then you cannot. Ah, yeah. So next golden rule though, keeping records. Talk, oh. to, me, talk to me about <laughs> records. What, what kind of records do we need to keep to justify a tax deduction? So you need to keep it for five years and bank statement is not going to be sufficient, everybody, because – your tax invoice needs to have the ABN, what it was used for. So, for example, if you went to a petrol station, you know, fill up your car and you bought like a drink or cheese and then you pay for it, the bank statement is not going to show you the breakup of the amount. So that's why the ATO said, no, you can't use the bank statement to substantiate your expenses. No, that's that's 100% correct. And and just to clarify on that, what we can actually do is keep digital records. And I think it's a great idea as soon as you incur an expense, take a photo of it and file that photo away. And then that way you've got that for your record. So you don't have to keep pieces of paper. But what the tax office wants you to do is they want you to keep a digital record or, or a physical one, a receipt that's going to show the name of the supplier the amount of the expense, the nature of the goods and services, the date the expense was paid and the date of the document. Now, why is this so important? I've got to tell you, if I could buy something and get a 30 or 40% discount, I'd grab it. Quite often we see people and they won't actually keep all their receipts so they can't claim all their expenses, which means they're missing out essentially on that 30 or 40% of that expense, if it was related to work, that they would get back. Makes it really expensive paying for things for work, doesn't it? That's right. If you want to get a benefit, you have to do a bit of work. That's (laughs) the tips. (laughs) Do I have to keep a record for everything or is there an amount? So if I travel and for lunch I buy a sandwich, which is $7, $8, do I have to keep the receipt even for that small amount? 
Now, what the ATO will allow you to do, if it's an expense up to $10, you don't need to keep a receipt as long as the total for that year is less than $200. So $10 or less, and the total of those receipts is less than $200. You don't need to keep it. And in fact, if your total expenses for the year are less than $300, you don't need to keep receipts for that either. Wow. Yeah. But you need to be able to justify it. So there was a period there where uh, lots of taxpayers were just putting down $300 as expenses. And it can be an awkward conversation when someone from the tax office says, can you please explain how you calculated that? So you still need to be able to justify it. So that's our expenses. And the last thing on record keeping, we need to keep those for five years. That's the advantage of digital records as well. Yeah, because otherwise some of the tax invoices, it just fade away and you, you can't really see what's yeah. on it. You mean times you clean out the car, clean out the centre console and you see, you get your receipt and there's actually nothing on it if it's been there that long. Yeah, that's right. So we've had a big year with a continued pandemic and we've had a few changes throughout that year. What are some of the tax changes we've seen this year, Young, particularly related to the pandemic? So it will be, your interest will be about the money that you receive from the Services Australia. If you had COVID, so you had to isolate it or you're unable to travel, whatever that might be that actually stop you from earning your income and you receive the money from the Services Australia, they are taxable payment, which means you have to include it in, on your tax return, but it's not going to be necessarily show you on your e-tax, the, the online system. You have to manually put them in. Okay, so you're talking COVID-19 disaster payments and what you're saying is that it's not actually going to show up on your PAYG summary no. from Services Australia. That's right, because it's not like the a JobKeeper payment. It's not the payment that came from the employer. It was the payment from the Services Australia directly made to you. Therefore, your employer is not going to have those record on your PAYG. Okay. And it's still a taxable payment. So um, you're going to have to get your receipt or some sort of verification from Services Australia and enter that manually in your tax return. That's correct. You can get the confirmation from Services Australia to show how much you have received. And they are fully taxable, those payments. Unfortunately, yes. That's a shame, <laughs> isn't it? It's kind of come back to bite. So hopefully everyone's put aside a little bit for those payments. Now, a lot of us have had to uh, spend money on COVID-19 tests. Are there any rules around the deductibility for those tests and the costs that we incurred on it? That's right. So if you can show or prove that it was for the employment-related purpose, then you can claim it. So if you're working in a health sector and your employer actually asks you to have a test result sent to them so that you can come to work, that is going to be the deductible expense. But if you had to do it for your kids to go to school, then obviously not. Okay. So if you need to do it, so that's once again, if we go back to where we spoke about the golden rules, a connection with work. That's correct. So if you had to do a COVID-19 test to go to work, you can claim a deduction for the cost of that test. That's correct. But if your employer paid for your expense, then no. Okay. And so that's if I, if I was in isolation and my work actually said, before you come back into the office, we want to see a negative COVID test, then I can claim that test. That's correct. As long as your employer doesn't give you the money for the <laughs> test kit. Okay, so if I just wanted to go to the football on the weekend, that's not deductible. Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> because of that connection to work. And I think it's something to remember with all of our deductions, how is this connected to earning accessible income or connected to, to your job? That's right. But in that example you just mentioned, if you're the coach, it's deductible. <laughs> if you're the coach of the football team, That's if right. you're pay being paid to be the coach though. That's right. Not if you're a volunteer coach. So no. always a connection to accessible income. Mm -hmm. And what have we seen in terms of super changes? That's a regular change, Chris. Yeah, there's been quite a few changes this year. So the biggest one is that employers now have to pay 10.5%. So that's the compulsory super contribution. So if you own a business and you want to you've got your employees, make sure you're paying 10.5% instead of 10%, which it was last year. Uh, and then the other one as well is 
that we've had for a couple few years now, the catch-up contribution. So if you've got your supers under 500,000, you've been able to look back four years and well, and now it's five years of anything you haven't done under the what we call the pre-tax limit, which is 27,500, you, you've actually got a full five years to use this year, which is the first time there's been a phasing in rule. This is the first time you've actually got five years if you haven't done anything for that time. Okay, so if you have a capital gain or a bit of windfall income, you can make a super contribution. That's and, right. And that will assist in managing the tax on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Also assist with your long-term saving and retirement goals. Well, that's, yeah, if there's more money in super, then you've got more when it comes to retirement. Though. That's you generally a good idea. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> right. Uh, and the other the other big one was that when you were over 67, so between 67 and 75, to actually put any money into super anymore, you had to be working. They've actually scrapped that rule. So if you're 70, you can actually put some money into super again. There's a lot of people that are really going to be able to benefit from that, that they sort of got to 67 and they thought, oh, can't get any, I'm still working, I want to put a bit more in, or you might have got an inheritance or something, but now that work test is gone. Is that because of with cost of living pressures, we're all going to be working till we're 100? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so if, if I hear you right, if you're over 70 and you don't have a job, you can't put any deductible contributions in, but if you're over 70, you're continuing to work, you can still claim a super. Yeah, so if you still, that's right. So to do the tax deductible one right up till 75, you do need to be working. But just to put the bigger lump sum, you can put a bigger lump sum. So up to 110000 a year, you can actually still put that in. Yeah. One of our biggest expenses is car expenses. And, and I will say one of my cautions when I'm talking to clients about their car deductions this year in particular is be really careful if you're going to claim on a per kilometre basis because we've had lockdowns. That's um, right. We've had people working from home. And if you're going to claim a full 5,000 kilometres, 100 kilometres a week, and you've been in lockdown for half the year or you work from home two, three days a week, you, you really could get some scrutiny on justifying it. That's right. With the 5,000 kilometres, one of the key things is that you don't need to keep a record of each kilometre, but what you need to be able to do is justify it on inquiry. Yeah. So if you say, if ATO knock on your door and say, how, how did you come up with 5,000 kilometres? And then say, oh, I did 100 kilometres per week then that's not going to cut the line because we had the lockdown and everyone had to work from home. So what kind of travel can you claim for generally with a motor vehicle? If you're travelling from home to work, that's your private expense. So that you're not going to be able to claim the kilometres for those. But if you actually went to work and had to go another office for a meeting, then that's work-related travel. So you could claim those. Any travel that you've done for conference or training, anything like that, client meeting, you can claim it as well. So we're going back to that rules. If it's a work-related, then it's a claim. You can claim that. But if it's anything to do with your private purpose, then you cannot. So once again, the connection to work, really, really important. So if I was to take my car and I drive from the office into work, no deduction there. But if I needed to go out and deliver something or go see a client or go to a meeting somewhere else, I can get a deduction for that. There are a couple of different ways you can do it. Talk me through the logbook method. So the logbook, you have to keep it for 12 weeks. Usually you will want to use it for the period that you do most of your business travel so that we work out total kilometres you've done in that 12 weeks period and then we work out how out of that 12 weeks kilometres how much was for work related and that becomes your portion to be able to claim for the business expenses. So if you say 60% of your travel was work related then we total up your fuel, your register, your insurance, your service, anything related to your car uh, maintenance then we can claim the 60% of that total. Okay. I've got to tell you, it's a lot of work keeping a logbook and you really have to be meticulous, don't you? That's right. If you want to get the deduction, you have to do some work. And do I have to do that every year? No. So if you've done it for 12 weeks, then, then you can use it for up to five years. But obviously, if you change your job or you change your car, then obviously you have to do a new logbook. 
Yeah, I've tried keeping logbooks and I will say I only ever claim on, personally, I claim on the per kilometre method and what I do is I just keep a note in my diary. Yeah, that's uh, a good way of doing yep, it. Yep, yep. So uh, I, I probably do, uh, most years I do the 5,000 kilometres, just a, a quick note in the diary, rough number of kilometres added up in the end of the year and that makes it a lot easier. And the other question that I always look at and if you're driving, let's say before you leave your home and you're going to see, instead of going into the office, you're going to see a client or do something work related, is that trip then to where you're going deductible? That's right. As Andrew mentioned, if you're actually traveling from home to a place that's not usual workplace, then it is a work related travel. Yeah. We've seen people asking us, well, I work from home now and if I go into the office, no. <laughs> that's that's not if you if you work from home and you go into your office that's still not a deduction. That's correct. So I think an area of scrutiny from the ATO this year. So I would be uh, particularly making sure that I had my records in order. Clothing and laundry is another common one. Who wants to talk us through the clothing and laundry expenses? So if you are doing a laundry that's for related clothing you can actually claim the expenses. But if you're, you know, dry cleaning or just a normal black pants and things like that, you cannot claim. Yeah. So if I went out, and because uh, I, I wear a suit to work, I can't get a deduction for that suit, can I? No, unless it's got an RSM logo on it. <laughs> Is that a reason why work uniforms are, are normally quite ugly? <laughs> oh, come on. You're getting better at that. No, but it's true. But that, that is the rule. If it's a piece of clothing that you can wear elsewhere for a social occasion, for example, you can't get a deduction. If it's, for example, you know, high vis, you you can't wear, you're not going to wear high vis to a party, hopefully. Unless that it's a dress up party. <laughs> Unless it's a dress up party. Or as you touched on, if it's got your company logo on there and that company logo is visible from about uh, 10 metres, I think it is. And um, this common one that I often get asked is about people working in the hospitality that actually ask, like, if I get a like, black shirt or black pants, comfortable shoes, can I claim it? No, you can't because it's not specific to your occupation and also it doesn't have a logo on it. What about steel caps for a work site? Steel caps, yes. Because they're protective clothing, Correct. aren't they? Yes. Yep. Yep. So, and laundry. Laundry is one where we can claim an amount each year. How do we calculate how much we can actually claim? The ATO say a dollar per load if the load is just made up of only work-related clothing. For instance, my husband is a builder, so I don't mix up his clothing with my clothing or the kids. So if I just do it for him, for with his own clothing, I can claim a, a dollar per load. But if you're actually doing mixing up with other clothing, then it's a 50 cents. Okay. <laughs> is there a limit on how much you can claim? Oh, it depends how much washing you do. <laughs> <laughs> Your water bill might take out your deduction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if we look at just making those, uh, we're going to have to wash our clothes, might as well get a deduction if it's available. It's a little bit of record keeping, but not a lot. Yeah, it doesn't take that long. If you can just write it down, as you said, with same as your kilometres, put yeah, it in so, the diary. So even with the laundry, if it's a, a 150 or less, then you don't have to keep a receipt. But it, obviously if you're going to say like $500 for the laundry, then... ATO will question you. Yep, yeah. Now, normally we would run through travel expenses in this podcast at this time of year, but who's been travelling, right? Mm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there isn't a lot. But one thing we're getting seen quite a bit on is self-education because people have used the pandemic to, to up their skills and self-education, if it's related to your work, can be deductible, can't it? That's right. Um, a lot of things that I got asked during the year was about, okay, if I'm getting a coaching about resilience, is that a deductible? What do you think, Andrew? Uh, I would say no, because that's personal. It's not related to earning your income. That's right. But what if it, the person is actually works in the coaching as a professional? If it adds to their skill set and increases their ability to earn income, and that's always the key I look for in self-education expenses. Is this going to lead to you generating further income in the future? 
well, then you're a good shot at it being deductible. Yeah. So it's not going to be what fits all for everybody. You have to look at the person's occupation, what they are doing. And and going back to this golden rules, is that going to be late to your income generating activities? And is it actually going to be applicable for now? Or is there something more general and it's a, more like a, leading you to uh, increase your income in the future, which is not necessarily connected to your current job, then you cannot claim that. But it has to be related to the job you're doing at the time. So for example, financial planner, if I do a finance course, I could claim that, but not if I say, learn how to drive plan. a truck. Yeah, exactly. That's but right. But at the same time, if you got a help deck, the hex debt, then no, you have to pay for it. Well. There you go. It's also, it's not just formal education, is it? So one area that we see is any tr trade, professional or academic journals are, are deductible and people quite often forget about those. If you need to get a textbook to review and study for your profession, other resources. So of course, definitely tuition fees. Oh yeah. And also the study time. So if you you can justify that you have spent this much time at home studying, you can claim home office expenses relate to the study. Okay, which can start to add up. Also, when you add in their computer consumables, a portion of internet. Yep. And that's when you tie into the home office that you mentioned. If you've got a particular spot at home, because there's a couple of different ways, isn't there, of claiming whether how you claim your time at home, being at home or working from, whether it's study, actual work, whether you, you've got a set space or whether you're just claiming the set rate method. That's right. So similar to the motor vehicle expenses, you can just do an hour. So, so how many hours you spend and then we just use the cents uh, per hour method. Or if you wanted to uh, claim a proportion of the expenses, then you need to have a dedicated space for just the work or the study. And then you can do that. But I will be very mindful of using that method because it could have impact on your capital gains tax when it comes down to selling your house. Yeah, that's right. So that's a good reminder, if you claim any portion of home expenses, even if it's self-education or work, it impacts on your CGT main residence exemption, doesn't it? That's right. If yeah, my client's actually living in a rental property, I would look at the both method and then work out which one gives them a better deduction and then choose that method. But if they're living in their own house, then I always just recommend using the hourly method. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned cars and deductions, you can actually get a deduction for travel between home and your place of education. So if you record that, and also between your workplace and the place of education. That's right. So because it's relate to your education, it's not for the work. So mm. that's why it's not the usual. So you would be claiming on the, the, the self-education expenses for that travel, not necessarily on the travel expenses. Yeah. And I've also been asked about the deductibility of any help loans. Well, unfortunately, they're not deductible. So the loan itself is not deductible, but any fees related to it. Uh, That's right. So self-education is a great one and it's one that, that once again creates more record keeping. There's no easy way around the record keeping, unfortunately, but you can actually do it. There's a bunch of apps, online services, or as I said, great way to keep any records for me is just the phone. I email it to myself and I have a folder there for tax deductions on my Outlook and I just file it under that and just keep it as a go sorted out at the end of the year. Another focus this year we think is going to be rental properties. So the tax officers flag to us that they're going to have a look at rental property expenses, particularly now that we have seen a lot more people who had previously had holiday houses and now uh, either working from them or they're keeping them for holidays because they're not going overseas. And it's, uh, it's quite a fraud area, isn't it? That's right. It comes back to the golden rules. So if you use it for your private, like you mentioned at the holiday house for your own use, obviously you can't claim the expenses. So you would have say out of the 12 month, I actually stay there for three months and then rent it out for nine months. Then obviously for those three months, you can't claim the deduction. So you work out the total expenses and then proportion is accordingly. Yeah, the ATO requires us to do that by the day. So not just by the month or week. 
So if you stayed there for that three months, so 90 days out of 365, you would have to reduce all of your expenses claimed by that proportion. So 90 divided by 365, that portion of everything would be considered private. Yeah. That's right. So have you used a short, one of those, the short term stays or Airbnb, uh, Airbnb, Airbnb, and then, so you did that for a a few months of the year, but then you used it for the rest of it. So what you're saying is it's only that time that it was rented and somebody else was paying you to use your place that you can get any deductions for. That's exactly right. So it's not just when somebody's paying you, it's when it's available for rental. So if you've got it advertised... Yep. And it's available. Yep. So even if it was a bacon that you didn't use it and it was available for renting but no one took the place, then you can it's still eligible. You can still claim the expenses because it was available for rent, just didn't have any tenants in it. That's correct. And look, there's a rental shortage at the moment, so you'd want to have a really good reason as to why it wasn't rented for a long period of time. And the ATO has advised that what they will do is look at how commercial your rate of rent is. So if you have a place, for example, that would normally rent for $500 per week and you've got it on the market at 1000 you're likely to be denied any deductions on review. That's right. And we don't want to be denied deductions because they lead to penalties and interest as well. Mm-hmm. What about you rent it a lot lower than the market rate? That's, uh, that's your problem. So only if it's to a non-related party. If you rent it at a lower rate to, say, your brother or your child, you're going to have to be put in commercial rent if you want to claim your deductions. That's right. You can't rent it out to family at a lower rate and get full deductions. But if you're happy to rent it out at a lower rate to strangers, non-related, arm's length, not a problem there at all. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Commissioner of Taxation can tell you to how to run things, but not if you have to run them well. If you're silly <laughs> enough to do that, uh, that's that's on you. So what else do we have on, on uh, rental properties? I, I, I think this issue of capital versus income is going to be a big one, repairs and maintenance in particular. What do we look for with repairs and maintenance? So if it was like a uh, wear and tear, if you've done the painting touch-up between the tenants, obviously I would say that that's a repair and maintenance and therefore you can claim it on your rental schedule. But if you had the house renovation, so you actually improved the value of the house and you've done it as a part of your renovation, I would regard that as a capital expense. Yeah. The one I really like is the uh, roof example. So say, for example, you had a, a tiled roof and the tiles were cracked and started leaking. Obviously, you're going to fix that. You you can't let water damage go. We all know that. So if you replace those with tiles, that's going to be fully deductible. That's correct. If I replaced it with, say, a nice colour bond tin roof? No, that's a capital. So it has to be like for like. That's right. So really, if you're going to improve anything, it's capital. If you're not, it's repairs and maintenance. The other examples that I hear come up about that is, for example, heating and cooling. If you've got maybe split system somewhere and you wanted to do a big ducted system, it's going to cost a a fair amount of money, but you're actually putting in a lot better, bigger system that probably improves the value of the home because of efficiency. And the other one's roller doors. So the old put the key in, put the roller door up versus driving up nicely and pushing the button. So they'd be classed as improvements. They'd be classed as improvements. And it doesn't mean that you don't get a deduction but what you're required then to do is depreciate it at the ATO rates over a period of time. So it might take you 10 years to get that deduction rather than in just the one year. So I think for rental properties, our really two key areas of focus is genuine rental and income arrangements for this year and making sure that you're not over claiming because you've decided you want to use it more. So now you'll spend it to improve the property, making sure that we have genuine repairs and maintenance. Another one that I wanted to touch based on is the new properties. So if you bought the new property, I would strongly suggest getting a building depreciation report so that you can actually claim those expenses. They're not the cash expenses you had, but it is the depreciating value of the building which enable you to claim the expense on your tax return to bring down your rental income. Yep. So once again, that so the 
rental property schedules and depreciation schedules are great because they do the record keeping for you, don't they? That's right. And normally that goes over what the life of the depreciable assets. You get it done once. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a great thing to do. Well, guys, there's some uh, really great views and hopefully some really good tips that are useful for our listeners there today. So thank you for uh, joining me, Young and Chris. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. This has been the RSM Talk Big podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast uh, wherever you normally get your favourite podcasts from. My name's Andrew Sykes, and on behalf of RSM and the Talk Big crew, thank you very much for listening. Talk Big. Create, save and protect with RSM.